This is Jason Dalton, a seemingly normal man until one winter's morning when he suddenly snapped. Jason used to be an average yet well-respected family man. But in February of 2016, after signing up as an Uber driver, he would do the unthinkable and go on a murder spree using the app. Even stranger, he believed that the devil was using it to control his every move. So, who is Jason Dalton? What caused him to change in an instant? Was there really a so-called devil behind the app? And how would the community of Kalamazoo react? Welcome or welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime, folks. My name is Adrian, and this is the story of Jason Dalton, a man whose deplorable actions were so sporadic that people still struggle to understand his reasoning even to this day. If you're new here, I like to caffeinate while I investigate, so if you do like true crime stories, please consider subscribing, it really does help me out. And now, with that out the way, please grab yourself a coffee, pull up a seat, and get ready for the deep dive. This is the case of Jason Dalton. Welcome to Kalamazoo, Michigan, folks. Found in the southwest region of the Great Lakes State, Kalamazoo is a vibrant city with a rich history. It is well known for its prominence in education and the pharmaceutical industries, and has many local breweries that produce a variety of beers. Interesting fact, but this city was initially called Bronson after one of the first white settlers in the area. However, after years of bad behavior, he was chased out of town never to return again. And that is when the townspeople renamed named it to Kalamazoo to better reflect its Native American heritage. Oh, and by the way, the reason that most pills nowadays are easy to swallow is actually because of Kalamazoo. William Arrestus Upjohn invented easily digested pills, and this colossal discovery led to the development of a pharmaceutical industry which now bears his name. The city of Kalamazoo is often celebrated for its dedication to the arts, evident in the numerous galleries, theatres, and cultural events throughout the year. It's not Natural beauty is complemented by parks and many recreational spaces, including the Kalamazoo Nature Center and the Calhaven Trail, providing many opportunities for outdoor activities. Overall, Kalamazoo embodies a harmonious blend of history, culture, education, and natural splendor, making it a distinctive and inviting community. But in February 2016, that friendly community was shattered by a crazed mass shooting across town. I was just driving down West Main, uh, heading towards 131 from downtown. Uh -huh. There was a man going roughly 70, 80 miles an hour, weaving in and out of both lanes of traffic. Where did they shoot at? County emergency. Yeah. Hello, I need a uh, ambulance police at 5111 High Metal Drive. Please hurry up. Somebody shot. Fire shot. She on the ground. I don't know if she hurt. Okay, ma'am, give me the number again. 5111 High Metal Drive in Savannah Trace Townhome. Okay, so female's down. She's been shot. Oh, don't, 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 move. don't move. Okay, where is the person that shot her? I don't know. The, 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 the car sped off. Please. Okay. County 911. Hi, we just drove by the Kia. Um, what, what road are we on? A 94 business, um, and a guy just shot some people in the parking lot. Kimsey County, 911. I'm at the um, Kalamazoo Cracker Brown, and there's been gunshots in a, in a car. Two cars have been shot up, there's three people in one car, and one guy is not moving. On the night of February the 20th, 2016, a spree shooting occurred at an apartment complex, a Kia dealership, and outside a Cracker Barrel restaurant. The town abruptly became aware that a crazed killer was on the loose, and with these shootings occurring over the course of several hours, nobody knew if it was over. Several calls were made to 911 during that time frame while the situation developed. It was eventually learned that the man behind these shootings was an Uber driver of all people, fleeing the scene every time. In the end, six people would lose their lives with two additional injuries, and dozens around these crime scenes were left shocked beyond all measure. But the gruesome details behind this story would not end there. The man who was behind all of this appeared to be delusional, and claimed that the Uber app was controlling his every move. The man's name was Jason Dalton, and although he did appear to be an average bloke, that sentiment could no longer be said. And so, with all of this in mind, let's dive into the world of Jason Dalton. 
Born in Greenfield, Indiana, Jason Dalton was the only child raised by his parents in an intact marriage. His parents were described as kind, good, and hearty people, and encouraged the only child to work for anything he wanted. The young Jason attended Eastern Hancock Middle and High School, before then moving to Kalamazoo. After making the move, he was a varsity football co-captain and graduated in 1989 from Comstock High. A teacher and coach in the Eastern Hancock District described Jason as an average student and a promising athlete. He regularly participated in the school's football, wrestling, and track programs, and was also interested in riding dirt bikes and fixing up old cars. So, Jason's hobbies and interests were quite typical for a young man. In December of 1992, when I myself was merely a few days old, he graduated from Kalamazoo Valley Community College with an associate degree in law enforcement. He was also perceived as a nice guy with a lot going for him, a far stretch from where he would eventually end up. After meeting a local woman named Carol, the two married in 1995 and had a happy relationship together. So much so, that they welcomed two children into the family in 2001 and 2006. Jason was the type of guy to be cordial with people, but was not necessarily outgoing. He barely went out of his way to make friends with people, and this introverted behaviour would deepen into his adulthood. Unfortunately, Jason's degree in law enforcement would not ever materialise into a job. According to an old friend, he had tried to find a job as a police officer in Michigan or any nearby states, but unfortunately, he wasn't able to find any open position that would take him. Furthermore, he had no interest in moving far away to find a police job, and with him wanting to remain in Kalamazoo, he decided to study auto bodywork at Wyotech instead. Following a change in his career path, Jason would work at a BMW office in New Jersey, this allowing him to get multiple jobs as a mechanic through the years. In his late twenties, Jason found his calling in the world of insurance, and knowing auto body work very well helped him in this new profession. Moving forward, he would eventually be contracted to other companies as an independent insurance adjuster. In his spare time, Jason would shoot targets or clay pigeons, and apparently, he would shoot for hours at a time, sometimes all day. Day long. Now, despite not having a big property, he would practice at home in his garden, and neighbours reported that these gunshots did sound like hunting rifles instead of automatic. But in the months leading up to 2016, subtle signs of instability began to appear. Despite being a mechanic and an insurance adjuster, Jason would regularly lose his temper towards customers. This included an incident in 2015, when Jason screamed at one of his customers over a dispute. And although things never became physical, it left the other guy absolutely traumatised. Another co-worker once saw Jason yell at a customer over the phone, slam the phone down, and then angrily pace around his desk. Apparently, Jason had previously been counselled over his aggression. But most of the time, Jason apparently was a very level-headed man. He loved his family, stayed out of trouble, and steered clear of substance abuse. According to him, he once tried marijuana in high school, but hated the taste of it. He also described himself as a social drinker, and had no medical issues or head injuries. In 2016, Jason decided to join Uber as a driver. He wanted a new way to supplement his income, and had to drive great distances for his regular job anyway. To him, this was a good way of making two streams of income simultaneously. Following several background checks, he was finally cleared to begin work on February the 9th, 2016. And moving forward, he would run the app off his phone while he continued with his regular job, which took him all around the county. Instead of attending the classes created by Uber, he mainly taught himself how to use the app. But this also meant that he had no idea what some of the app's alerts and gestures were. To add to that, he didn't know how to use Bluetooth, and didn't know what the notifications meant. In addition to this confusion, he never logged off the app when at home or even at night. He understood that he technically could, but just never did. As a result, the app would never let him mentally switch off. Apparently, this meant that the app often flashed at him in the middle of the night, preventing him from any proper sleep. In the days leading up to February the 20th, Jason's wife and close friends noticed that he seemed rather tired, depressed, and down. As an attorney would later put it, he didn't appear to be his usual gregarious self. Now, this tiredness could perhaps have been related to his inability to switch off 
from the app while he intended to sleep. But again, this was entirely in his control to change. Neighbors also reported him to be acting rather paranoid too. Throughout these days, he would constantly check on his guns and seemed to be a little more on edge than usual. Speaking of guns, on the morning of February the 20th, 2016, he traveled to a gun shop that he frequently visited. Although he would usually drop by to chat with the owners without buying anything, this time was different. Jason was in and out of that shop within several minutes, only stopping to purchase a heavy-duty tactical jacket. And this is where our story becomes very bizarre very quickly. You see, Jason claimed that on the same afternoon of him visiting that gun store, the Uberap suddenly took control of his mind and his body. After entering a silver Chevy Equinox, Jason also claimed that something entered the vehicle with him. This thing was growling at him and made him feel like he was on fire. And this is where it gets very, very strange. According to Jason, a bunch of unrecognizable symbols appeared on his app and when he tapped them away, the devil's head appeared on his screen. He was in control when the app turned red, but when it turned black, he was a puppet to the devil. And apparently, the moment he touched that screen, the app turned black. And whether his confession was absolutely baloney or not, his actions in the hours ahead would have terribly grave consequences. 911? Hi. Um, I'd like to report an erratic driver. Where? Um, I was just in the car with him. He was my Uber driver, and when we, he was weaving, weaving in and out of lanes, he sideswiped the car on West Main Hill. He was driving like 75 miles an hour down West Main. I got his license plate number when I jumped out of the car. Hey, what kind of car is it? It was like a Chevy Equinox. What color? Uh, silver. He had a dog in the back seat. He was, he was my Uber driver, like I, I wanted to just, I just wanted to report it because I don't want someone sure. to get hurt. I, I understand I what you're saying, but I need to know if you want to talk to an officer or if you want me to have an officer, you should be on the lookout for it. I just want to be on the lookout. And okay, thank you. Report I'll to know. Uber because I don't think he, he needs to be picking Okay, you're going to have to do that, sir, not us. All right, I can do that. Thank you. At 4.30pm, a local man named Matt Mellon jumped into an Uber. After spending the previous night out drinking, he was now ready to go collect his car. And after jumping into his Uber vehicle, he was greeted by his driver, Jason Dalton. Jason introduced himself as Mimi, and would also introduce his dog in the backseat of the car, which was rather unusual for an Uber driver. Although their drive initially began fine, Jason received a phone call shortly into the journey. He said he'd call them back before hanging up, but that is when his demeanor suddenly changed. Jason suddenly started speeding, sideswiping cars and driving over lawns and medians. He ran through multiple red lights, nearly taking himself and other vehicles out in the process. He began to scream his directions out loud, repeatedly telling his passenger, this is my destination, over and over again. As soon as the vehicle came to a stop, Matt jumped out of the car as quickly as he could. Jason's commotion had caught the attention of several other bystanders, all of which who were just as confused as Matt was. He then phoned the police. By then, multiple calls had already been made by other shocked witnesses, but Jason, he had already sped off into the distance. It's important to note here how dismissive, rude, and unsynchronized the operators were. Matt had offered valuable information to identify a man who was a current danger to the public. Yet, sadly, throughout all of these phone calls, most of that info was glossed over. Okay, just a second, let me get your right place, okay? Stand the line. I need to transfer you one more time. I'm going to transfer you to the city because that's where the accident actually occurred, so hang on one second. Okay. Jason drove back home in a similar manner, driving at illegal speeds while racing through traffic lights before parking his vehicle in a back driveway behind the house. According to Jason, a strange feeling had overcome his body. He rushed inside, drank a glass of water, and then entered his basement. Next, he prepared his guns, loaded them with full magazines, and put all of them together in a black duffel bag. Jason was now armed with a loaded Glock 9mm pistol, 
and furthermore had equipped himself with a bulletproof vest. Stepping back into his Chevy Equinox vehicle, he was then offered to take on a new Uber ride. At around 5.30pm, after accepting the new ride, he sped towards his destination. He travelled to Meadows Town Homes, an apartment complex found on the northeastern edge of Kalamazoo. Jason was looking for a woman named Macy who just happened to book the fare for her boyfriend, and with her boyfriend walking around this neighbourhood, Jason could not find the woman he was looking for. He made several laps around this estate, growing more agitated by the minute. He eventually set his eyes on a woman named Tiana, who, at the time, was leading five children to the playground, including her daughter. Jason asked Tiana if she was Macy, to which she replied no. Jason then sped off, doing another lap around the neighbourhood, before then approaching Tiana again, even faster. For the second time, he asked her if she was Macy. But before she could even respond, Jason had raised his gun to her face, and with his left hand still on the wheel, he unloaded his magazine in her direction. Tiana was shot multiple times, falling to the floor as she told the children to run. Now, fortunately, all of the children remained unharmed, but as for Tiana, she had several injuries that needed urgent attention. Um, yes, I live in Meadows Apartments. Right, we've got the call on the female that's been shot. We've got people on the way. Did you see the suspect? No, I'm doing a serious. I just wanted you guys to get Yeah, we've got shot. people on the way, okay? So somebody has been shot then? Yes, ma'am. Okay, ma'am, still with me? Yeah, I got a, a, a firefighter here right now. Okay, okay. Um, let me get your name real quick, okay? Yeah. County Emergency? Do you know this girl's name? No, I don't. She's right now, she's with him. He's looking at her, and I hear cops coming. Uh, they're on their way, okay? Thank you so much. Bye. After unloading the entire magazine, Jason sped off towards his parents' home. He then called his wife to ask for the keys to the Hummer truck, which just so happened to be parked there. After arriving, he found his wife and children outside. Carol had no idea what was going on, but nevertheless began to grow worried. She sensed that something was wrong with Jason. She noticed his eyes were different, and that he was acting very, very bizarrely. Jason ran upstairs, grabbed his father's gun, and then gave it to his wife, who by now was clearly distressed and confused. He told them to stay inside and not leave the property, and after being unable to start the Hummer truck, he instead took Carol's HHR. Now, you might be surprised to learn that, after this incident, Jason returned to his job as an Uber driver, and completed several rounds without any incident or fault. Under the disguise of a new vehicle, and acting calmly, nobody had any reason to believe he was a dangerous suspect at large. Rumours of a rogue Uber driver began to circulate around town, but nobody knew who it was. Unfortunately though, this calm behaviour would not last forever. At 10pm, after several successful trips, Jason slipped once again. Paranoia kicked in, and he believed that several black SUVs were circling him. Furthermore, the so-called devil from the Uber app told him to look out for a black BMW. Meanwhile, Richard Smith and his 17-year-old son Tyler had parked at a dealership along Stadium Drive. Tyler was finally old enough to think about buying a car, and his father was just as excited to help him. Both men got out of their car to look at a blue Ford pickup truck, with Tyler's girlfriend remaining in the back seat of his father's car. That is when Jason walked up to them from his vehicle, and immediately fired several rounds into both men, tragically killing both father and son. Alexis watched as this man walked up to her boyfriend and his father, and fired at both of them at point-blank range, and even after both of them had fallen to the floor, he continued to fire several rounds into them. Scared for her life, she hid behind the back seats, praying that she wasn't next. That is when she heard Jason circling the Range Rover, and then trying to open the front door. Fortunately, the car's autolock mechanism had been activated, and with him no longer able to gain access, he walked away without ever knowing she was there. After waiting about 90 seconds, she crawled out of the Range Rover, went over to her boyfriend who sadly had passed away, grabbed his phone, and dialed 911. Meanwhile, others had already phoned the emergency services to report this unfolding tragedy, 
But sadly, it was too late, for Jason had already fled the scene. 911, where's your emergency? Hi, we're on Business 94. We passed the um, Kia dealership, and there, we just passed with somebody shooting a gun at two people lying on the ground. Okay, you just, okay, the Kia dealership where? Um, it's on Business 94 um, in Kalamazoo. We are pulled into the Burger King, which is a couple um, businesses down. There's a Tufty Auto Center. Uh, I'm sorry, we're okay, not in the area. Okay, so you're on Stadium Drive. Did you see... Uh, who the person was that was shooting? Uh, no, it was a, I just turned because we heard gunshots and there was a man standing there pointing a gun at two people lying on the ground. We could see the, see the smoke from his gun and hear it as we drove by and we just pulled in. I don't know, we're probably 150 yards from okay. them. There's an SUV still sitting in the parking lot. All right, and you said the people are laying on the ground still? Uh, we can't see them. There's okay. cars blocking our way, but the SUV that was parked there is still there. It's running with their uh, like brake lights on. Uh, the key is 4102 Stadium Drive. All right, ma'am, I'm going to go ahead and get an ambulance on the way. After returning to his vehicle, Jason continued to calmly accept Uber assignments. Despite this being his third wave of aggression, each one was becoming more violent and consequential. His dangerous ride with Matt was lucky enough to end without harming anyone. And although he had seriously injured Tiana, she was still alive. Tragically though, his most recent incident ended in the death of two innocent men, and his fourth outburst would be even worse. Shortly after 10.20pm, he made his way to the Cracker Barrel off of 9th Street, which is located around 5 miles away from the Kia dealership. After having a small issue with an unrelated Uber fare, he then approached a white van and shot a female driver inside. The driver, who was Mary Lou Nye, was a 60-year-old woman who had just finished a night out with friends. And as those friends, all located in another car, saw her get shot, they screamed out in shock. Jason responded by approaching their car and firing at all four on board. Dorothy Brown, Mary Jo Nye, Barbara Hawthorne, and a 14-year-old Abigail Kopf were all shot at point-blank range. After attempting to murder five more people, Jason got back into his car and drove 16 miles back home. By 11.20pm, he was heard back in his garden, and after firing several rounds into his shed, he reloaded his pistol and got back into his car. And if his actions and behaviours weren't outrageously strange enough, Jason then returned to his Uber job, completing several more fares as if nothing had happened. It would take officers more than two hours after the final murders, and more than seven hours since his first incident to finally piece the story together. And of course, it was at that moment that they finally realised that they were dealing with a murderous Uber driver. Now, bear in mind here that Matt, who had called in to report Jason's behaviour more than seven hours prior, even offered to give the license plate and Uber ID to the operator. Alas, these details were missed, and Jason was allowed to carry on with this rampage for several more hours. After officers responded to both crime scenes, located about 5 miles and 20 minutes apart, it became apparent that they were likely dealing with a potentially active shooter. Witnesses claimed that the gunman was driving a dark-coloured vehicle, with some identifying it to be a Chevrolet HHR. Fortunately, the Kia dealership had recently installed a new surveillance camera. This was used to confirm Jason's description, and then relayed to all other officers in the area. But that didn't stop Jason and from calmly completing more Uber assignments in the meantime. Shortly after midnight, he picked up and then dropped off three other passengers, before accepting another four just several minutes later. One of the groups even asked him if he was the shooter, to which Jason replied with no in a very emotionless manner. He then picked up another group of three, before dropping them off without incident. Although most of them had a sneaking suspicion, none of these ten passengers were aware that they were being ferried by an active spree killer. At 12.36am, an officer who was currently on duty watched Jason as he dropped off those final three passengers. With concern and curiosity, he followed Jason's vehicle while requesting for backup. After around two minutes of stalking, he then flashed Jason to pull over. Although they had no idea how he would respond, Jason was calm and compliant after they asked him to hold his hands out of the window. Officers then approached his vehicle without any incident 
opening the door to pull Jason out of his car. Police found him to be wearing a bulletproof vest and a fully loaded handgun. He was arrested without a fight, and although his reign of terror was now finally over, this was only the beginning for the world to understand why he murdered so many. Seven people were shot dead and several others wounded in the US state of Michigan on Saturday night. A suspect was arrested and has been named as Jason Dalton. Authorities and local media said three separate and apparently random shootings took place in Kalamazoo County. We have multiple people dead. In summary, what it looks like is we have somebody just driving around, finding people and shooting them dead in their tracks. Four people were reportedly shot at a Cracker Barrel restaurant, including a 14-year-old girl. A father and son were gunned down at a Kalamazoo car dealership. Police and the Kalamazoo Crime Lab were searching a house registered to the 45-year-old suspect. The local county sheriff's office reported a weapon was found inside his vehicle. In the afternoon of the following day, Jason's interview with Sergeant Gorham revealed several chilling yet strange details. I know I've said a few of these details already, but I'm going to repeat them to clarify Jason's frame of mind. Jason confirmed that he hadn't been sleeping very well in the days leading up to his spree. He had recently joined Uber, but the app would not let him shut down and would always ask him if he was online. He further blamed the app for causing his sleep issues, and also stated that something had come into his car, and he felt like he was on fire. Jason admitted that he didn't fully understand how the app worked, but he did believe that one ding meant yes, and two dings meant no. Terrifyingly, when one of his last Uber rides asked him if he was going to kill them, Jason said no only because the app had dinged twice. Near the beginning of his spree, a sensation apparently came over his body, causing him to accelerate in his vehicle. At this moment, Jason truly believed that he was being possessed to drive faster. When asked if Jason had ever thought about helping the people he had shot, he simply said, it just had a hold of me, further indicating that he was possessed and unable to support. He also said that it ended only after being arrested, and that is when he came back to reality. Jason knew that his actions were wrong despite these statements. He confessed that he was aware that people would now look at him like a monster. He further added that he was sorry and saddened by his actions, and advised that he could not say any words that could bring closure. Is Uber at U-B-E-R? Mm -hmm. You just recently been joined up with them. Yeah. Am I okay to talk yeah. about what happened? Yeah. I know that you guys are gonna have a hard time believing this, but it literally took over mind and body. The Uber app? Yes. I really didn't even see what the, what the sim, I, I just tapped it. And then there was like a devil head that popped up. It was some sort of like horned, horned head, like a cow head or something. And I pressed that button and that's where all the problems went after that. Meanwhile, officers were getting comfortable at the Dalton residence and they were shocked by what they would find. Bullet casings, gun accessories, and Pepsi cans littered the home. A basement arsenal contained hordes of ammunition rounds which were stored in cans and boxes, along with numerous long guns, handguns, a hunting bow, and a large, brightly coloured squirt gun. In the home's backyard, bullet holes could be seen through a shed, the fence, and playground equipment. And although I don't have a picture of it, they apparently had a very grimy bathtub. Throughout the house, piles of clothes were sprawled on the floors, with empty cans and containers littered on shelves and tables. From these pictures alone, it is not clear if Jason's actions were premeditated or not, but what did become obvious is that he had far more firearms than the average American. And with the national average of 1.2 firearms per person in the United States, Jason was more than 10 times that figure at 17. With the city of Kalamazoo waking up to the terrible news, these details were not overlooked, and the community learned that they were dealing with six deaths and two injuries. Although Kalamazoo is known to have a higher crime rate than the national average, this was the worst incident to happen in recent history. And now, all they could do was mourn. 
several vigils were held across the city. Hundreds of candles were lit in a nearby church. Meanwhile, local stadiums were filled with those paying their respects. In the parking lot of the restaurant where four people died, members of the community gathered to pay their respects. Many were left wondering how such an incident was allowed to happen. This was not just any typical shooting. Jason's actions were allowed to occur over the entire day and several locations. In a perfect world, if the phone operators and authorities were hot in his tail after his initial incident, then no one would have had to die or be injured. Matt Mellon reacted perfectly. The fact that he gave a vehicle description, license plate, and even the Uber ID was all the authorities needed to shut Jason down. They were even given a second chance after his grievous assault against Tiana, and Jason never tried to hide from the authorities either. Instead, he continued to travel around town and even actively serve passengers, some of which even thought that he could have potentially been the shooter. I don't see enough talk about this, to be honest, because from account suspension all the way to heightened patrols, the authorities really did seem to miss every opportunity they had. And of course, these details left many, including some of his victims, both angered and confused. Now, we'll get back to Jason's psychological evaluation later, but the point that I'm trying to make here is that law enforcement's reaction simply wasn't enough. On February the 22nd, 2016, Jason faced arraignment on 16 charges, including six counts of murder, two counts of assault with intent to commit murder, and eight counts of using a firearm during the commission of a felony. He was scheduled to appear in court for a preliminary examination hearing on March the 10th. On March the 3rd, he was also ordered to undergo a psychiatric evaluation to assess his competence to stand trial. Of course, with his story of the Uber Devil, evaluators had to ensure he wasn't insane. By April the 22nd, he was declared to be of sound mind, and his competence was confirmed by the Michigan Center for Forensic Psychiatry. On May the 20th, Jason appeared for a preliminary hearing to determine the sufficiency of evidence for trial. During these proceedings, he would sadly make several disruptions of outbursts. This also interrupted Tiana Carruthers' testimony, which just so happened to be caught on camera. You know, I, I um, saw a gun. Kennedy in her cars. No. They gave bags, these old people, they have these old no. black bags, they're called, they're black, they're black bags, and people drive around and look at them. It gets real, like, hey, and it's time people look, and then that's when they tell people it's time to get the temple. You need to listen to your attorney, right? Yeah, you need to get to temple because you need to get going because it's called intimidate for You need to be quiet in today's proceedings, okay? Yeah. Being the first victim to his shootings, she was already uncomfortable to share a room with this man. And with him lashing out like this, she understandably relapsed. After being restrained and removed from the courtroom, he rejoined via video link from jail. The hearing resumed later that same day. Following a pre-trial conference on June the 6th, Jason's attorneys announced their plans for legal insanity defense. In response, another psychiatric evaluation by the Michigan Center for Forensic Psychiatry took place over the following 60 days. Although his trial was tentatively set for late September or early October, several evaluations and many disagreements delayed it for multiple years. Eventually, jury selection was scheduled to begin on January the 3rd, 2019, with opening statements beginning on January the 7th. However, in a a surprise, on the day of opening statements, Jason pleaded guilty to all counts. Under those circumstances, uh, Mr. Williams, what is the agreement? Your Honor, Mr. Dalton will be pleading guilty to all counts in counts 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and 11. He will be entering a plea to first degree premeditated murder in counts 13 and 15, he will be entering a guilty plea to the count as charged, assault with intent to murder, and he will also be entering a guilty plea to the associated uh, felony firearm charges, which make up the even number counts in the felony information. Subsequently, on February the 5th, 2019, Jason Dalton received a life sentence without the possibility of parole, thus forever condemning him to a cell behind bars until the day he dies. Love is stronger than hate. Light is stronger than darkness. 
life is stronger than death. That victory is ours because of him who loves us. It's a court sentence as to count one. I have to go through each of them individually. Count one, that you, Jason Brian Dalton, be remanded to the custody of the Michigan Department of Corrections and be sentenced to a period of life in prison without the possibility of parole. This is to be served consecutive to those sentences that will be given in counts 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, and 16. Also, they are to be concurrent. It is to be concurrent with counts 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, and 15. Since then, he has been incarcerated at the Oaks Correctional Facility. With Jason pleading guilty before his trial began, most of his psychological evaluations have not been released to the public, and so with that in mind, we aren't quite sure what he potentially suffers from. And although his initial health assessment declared him to be competent to stand trial, no further and more in-depth assessments have been concluded. It's worth noting here that Jason remained almost entirely emotionless throughout his confession, and was very matter-of-fact when he told the officers that the app was controlling him. Jason's main argument here is that he was under the control of the app, which does suggest he may have suffered from psychosis or prolonged delusions. What I find interesting is that Jason often flipped between periods of delusional murder and then being entirely calm behind the wheel, which directly contradicts these conditions. Furthermore, although Jason appeared to be acutely sad in the days leading up to the shooting, he did not suffer from chronic depression and had no history of poor mental health. So, did the devil have a hold of Jason? Was this psychosis? Or was this all just one giant excuse? Sadly, we have no idea. And although many would be quick to call him a liar, his actions really do not make any sense whatsoever. Although Jason did have the means and opportunity to commit these murders, no motive can be found. He had no heightened emotional connection to the victims, was not going to gain anything from their deaths, and had plenty of reason to simply not become a mass murderer. The only reason why he would do such a thing would be to gain fame and recognition after concluding that he was thoroughly done with his life, which, in fairness, is still a possibility. I want to end this video by repeating the weird delusion that Jason claimed to have had, because, quite frankly, I think it reiterates how insane his story sounds. Jason told officers that it would blow their minds if only they knew what he had gone through. He further explained how, when he opened the Uber Taxi app, a symbol appeared, and he recognised that symbol as the Eastern Star. Jason also claimed that a devil head popped up on his screen, and when he pressed the button on the app, that is when all of the problems started. He said that the iPhone could take you over, and explained how you can drive over 100 miles per hour and go through stop signs and you can just get places. Basically, he described what it means to be a reckless driver in a fast car. He also told the officers that this devil figure who took over his body had a horned cow head, and that, furthermore, it gave him assignments throughout the night. Allegedly, this devil would take over his body until he was done. During his interrogation, Jason admitted that he felt bad for the victims. To add to that, he wasn't aware that some of them survived either. Not that this would change his outcome whatsoever. By the way, speaking of legal proceedings, this wouldn't be the only case that Jason had to see through the courtroom, because shortly after his arrest, his wife Carol Dalton filed for divorce. Now I do have to give her a lot of credit here, because many people will refuse to believe that the person they once loved could be a bad apple, but Carol was very rapid in her decision. Now, in the weeks after the shootings, there was a rumour circulating that apparently Jason had filed a lawsuit against Uber claiming they had ruined his life, and furthermore, he was seeking $10 million in compensation. However, investigators later confirmed that this was fake, created by some low-life imposter. Richard Smith, known as JR by friends and family, was a good father. He was supporting his son, Tyler, when they were both gunned down. Formerly a pipe fitter working for Pfizer, he blossomed to become a construction manager and a proud full-time husband and father. He was 53 years old when he died. His passion in life was his family, 
and being a friend to everyone blessed to know him. With specialties of cheesy potatoes, brookies, and a secret barbecue recipe that only he knew. He was the rock for his family, both immediate and extended. Born on April the 27th, 1998, Tyler was only 17 years old when he died. He was a senior at Matawan High School and attended Van Buren Technology Center. His passion was soccer, and he loved visiting Silver Lake with his family. He shared a love of cars with his father, and sadly died searching for his very first car. Both men are dearly missed by their family. Mary Jo and her sister-in-law, Mary Lou, were shot and killed at Dalton's last stop. Mary Jo was born the sixth of seven children and graduated from Lakeshore High. She loved to cook and sew with her mother, and went on to become an excellent teacher and mentor. After retirement, she spent her time traveling, seeing family and friends, and continuing to help students. She was an avid quilter and skilled baker who loved to teach others her crafts. Her last day was spent with some of her closest friends, enjoying an outing at the theater which was her joyful habit. Mary Lou was 62 years old when she passed away. She worked as a daycare worker, only after previously working for the Michigan Secretary of State for 30 years. Believe it or not, this incredible woman was also a Master Sergeant in the US Air Force Reserve. Tragically, her husband also lost his sister in the shooting. Dorothy Brown was another victim at the Cracker Barrel spending her evening with Mary and Mary. The 74-year-old worked for Guardian Finance and Advocacy in Battle Creek, and previously worked as a caseworker for the Area Agency on Aging. While in college, Dorothy married Edwin Reynolds, but later remarried Curtis Brown. And in her death, she leaves behind her two children, Jeff and Rob Reynolds. In addition to Mary Lou's, Mary Jo's, and Dorothy's deaths, Barbara Hawthorne also passed away outside the Cracker Barrel. Barbara had recently retired after working for Kellogg's company in Battle Creek for 22 years. She was with her granddaughter, Abigail Kopf, at the time of the shooting. Six victims, six lives lost at the hands of Jason Dalton. A man who seemingly had it together up until the day that he violently snapped. Hundreds are now forever affected by the loss of a loved one. Some even too. Although Tiana was unlucky to cross paths with Jason, she was fortunate enough to survive the shooting. She was shot several times and therefore had to go through multiple surgeries and treatments. Since this terrible day, she has now become a motivational speaker for her business named Shero with a message. When Abigail Kopp was shot in the head, she was only 14 years old at the time. Since then, she has been through several surgeries, including two where metal was placed in part of her brain that was shattered by a bullet. But after almost two years of treatment and rehab, she has finally returned to school. I sincerely wish both Tiana and Abigail the very best moving forward. Matt Mellon could have become Jason's very first victim, yet thankfully, he managed to get away unscathed and even help the authorities. I also hope that, wherever Matt is, he's doing well. What frustrates me the most about this case is the lack of reasoning behind his crimes. Without any answer, it does beg the question, could this happen again? I think that, in this instance, it would be good to know what Jason's final psychological evaluations were, and furthermore, how he feels about his actions now. Without those things, it does leave this story entirely up for debate. And so, with that in mind, please let me know what you think in the comments down below. Do you think that Jason really did suffer from some sort of delusion? Or do you think it was just one giant excuse? Anyway, I think that's pretty much the end of the video, folks. I know that this was a long one, so thank you so much for hanging out until the end. And speaking of which, did you like the longer form content? If you want to support the channel, you can find my Patreon here, or alternatively, check me out on social media here, most notably my Instagram. You can also support me, the channel, and Nero by checking out Classified Coffee, my very own coffee brand. And I really mean it when I say that this is the best dark roast I've ever had. That's classifiedcoffeeco.com. Anyway, folks, that is the end. Thank you again so much for watching, and as always, I'll see you again very soon for another one. Until that moment arrives, though, remember to look after yourself, look after each other, and of course, stay safe. Thank you, and goodbye.